Lord that anyone who is in Christ is a, a new creation. Old things have passed away. Behold, all things have become new. Where, yeah. Second Corinthians five seven. Good job, Jim. Anybody else? Second. Go ahead. Go ahead. You guys <laughs> just just stand up and do it Baptist as you dance. First. <laughs> Go ahead. Second uh, Corinthians five seventeen. If anyone, no, wait a minute. Therefore. Therefore, if anyone is in Christ, he is a new creation. Old things have passed away. Behold, all, all things have become new. First Corinthians five seventeen. Second, Second Corinthians five seventeen. Good job. Good job. Anybody else? Second Corinthians five seventeen. Therefore, if any man be in Christ, is a new creature. Old things are passed away. Behold, all things are become new. Second Corinthians five seventeen. Good job, Ray. Thank you. <coughs> Anybody else? I don't know about you guys, but I, like I circled if, and it says therefore if anyone is in Christ. It's not just to say, hey, examine yourself and say, hey, see, see if you are in Christ. But it's really, uh, I mean, that's, that's the word there that gives it all. If you're in Christ, now you are this new creation. But first you have to say, am I in Christ? You know, did I, did I believe in Jesus Christ's finished works on the cross? <clears throat> and if you did... It, it says he, using the masculine pronoun, but you, as a, you would become a child of God, baptized into the body of Christ, and you become a new creation. And it's not just, you know, it, it might look like the creator created something new, but he took at the cross, if you're in Christ, it's speaking of the cross. And at the cross, your old nature is now rendered powerless. Your old nature becomes buried and crucified with Christ, like we talked about in Galatians 2.20. And you become a new creation. Well, that new creation is you get a new nature. You get, you get a spiritual nature. He had just talked about don't regard anyone as, as flesh anymore. And that's if you're in Christ. See, now we know that there's a spiritual realm. And that the things that we, that, that we shouldn't be doing are of the flesh. They're the old nature. And I think the Bible in so many places does not clearly tell us that. And it's something that you have to search deeper for, but it's talking about our nature. See, we had a, a we were born in sin, born with a sin nature because Adam and Eve didn't believe God. And they listened to the lies of the devil. Now listen to me, because we talked about this before. If Adam and Eve, listen, who did not have a sin nature, were believing the devil instead of believing God, then it's possible for you and I, who now have been given new natures and become new creations, to still be duped by the devil if we don't listen to the word of God and become in fellowship with one another. And we don't let the Holy Spirit lead us and teach us. It's so easy for us to listen to the old nature and follow the flesh. Who's in cahoots with the devil? The flesh is in cahoots with the world. The flesh is in cahoots with the flesh. And it, it, it's an enemy of God. That's the old nature. That's why Christ had to come and die for us. So that we could put it in the grave. We could render it powerless. That, the, the, the domain of darkness, like we talked about on Sunday, is rendered powerless. But you have to believe that by faith and begin to appropriate the new creation. Walk in the newness of life. Follow the Holy Spirit. Be led by the Spirit through the Word of God. If we're in Christ, 
It's, it, it's who we are now, new creations with a new nature, a new heart that's led by the Spirit of God because we've become children of God and the old nature has passed away. Why? Because what do you do with something when it passes away? You put it in the grave and we're crucified. It's in the grave. Reckon yourself dead. Put it in the grave. When you see it, kick it in the face by the power of the Holy Spirit. Remind it of the cross. Beat it with the cross if you have to. Beat it with the finished work of the cross. And beat it back down into the grave and remind yourself that you have victory in Jesus. I know that sounds a little crazy, doesn't it? But the devil would like for you to play games with your flesh and keep it up out of the grave and say, can I just put my hand up? Can I just do a little bit? No, there's nothing good that dwells in the flesh. It needs to be in the grave and dead and buried. It's going to stink no matter when you raise it up out of the ground. So behold, all things have become new. I love that, that we can be new creations in Christ. It's the newness of life, Paul calls it. Walk in the newness of life. And this next verse goes with that. If you want to look at Romans with me. Because <clears throat> next week, next couple weeks, maybe even three weeks. I haven't decided yet. We're going to do Romans 12, 1 and 2. Now, many of you have already done this with us. But we want to get back to it. We want to look at it. I like to walk through some of these um, scriptures that we've done. And go back to them and be reminded of them. Remember, he says again. I beseech you, therefore, he had been talking about the mercies of God, uh, the mercies toward Israel, he said, and, it, and because of uh, Israel, it's, it's mercy toward us, I beseech you, he says, I urge you, I plead with you, I beg with you, you can look it up, that's what this is talking about, he's not commanding you, he's not, he's not, he's not making you, he's begging you, listen, you're saying, well, is that how you do it? Yes, any way we can get people to listen, sometimes is good. And he says, I beseech you, therefore, brethren. Notice he's talking to believers. And it says, by the mercies of God. And it may be better translated because of or in considering the mercies of God <coughs> that you present your, your bodies a living sacrifice Holy, acceptable to God, which is your reasonable service. And do not be conformed to this world, but be transformed by the renewing of your mind, so you may prove what is that good and acceptable and perfect will of God. And I love this. Listen, brethren and sistren. Listen, children of God. Listen, Christ is the mercies of God. Listen. Christ is the mercies of God. The grace that we're saved by faith is part of the mercy of God. See, mercy is not getting what we deserved. We deserve death, and God gave us mercy. And then in grace, he gave us what we don't deserve. God's riches at Christ's expense by faith. He gave us what we don't deserve. We don't deserve the grace of God. It's not enough that we were rendered not guilty, but now he's given us an inheritance. We become his children. And when you begin to look at this, and, and that's what he's saying, that I urge you, I plead with you, when you look at the mercies of God, it's not by works of righteousness, which we have done, but according to his mercy, he saved us, Titus 3, 5 says. His mercy. And grace is part of his mercy. He didn't just not kill us because of sin, but he poured out the blood of his son on the cross to save us and give us new life and make us new creations. And when you think about that, that's what he's given us. This entire picture here is of the Old Testament sacrifices where they would bring a lamb for slaughter. Listen to me. And they, because of their sin, something had to die, and they knew that. And that's what we need to be looking at because of our sin that Jesus died on the cross. And that's the mercies of God. When you consider that, he's saying consider that because of the mercies of God that you present. Just bring your bodies a living sacrifice. 
They're dead. They're in the grave. They're, and Christ needs to be living through us. So you just bring them as a living sacrifice. Now, in the Old Testament, they would bring these, these sacrifices, and they would be a kofar is what it was called. It was called a covering. It didn't take away the sins, but it covered them so a holy God could live with them. It covered them, always looking forward to when Christ would come and take away the sins of the world. And now when you consider that mercy, our sins aren't covered. They've been taken away. They've been cast as far as the east is from the west, cast into the sea of forgetfulness. Have you ever thought about that, the east is from the west? North and south will meet. If you're looking at north and south, they meet. You're going south, all of a sudden you start going north. East and west never meet. You just keep, you're going east, you just keep going east. They never meet. But, it, but the north and the south, they meet. They're cast into the sea of forgetfulness. Not because, not because God can't remember. It's because he chooses not to remember because they've been paid for in full to tell us die at the cross. So you present your bodies a living sacrifice. You know what's wrong with living sacrifices? It's not like the, the blood of a lamb where you would hold its neck and the priest would take a knife and cut its neck and the blood would run out on the altar. That was the sacrifice. And you had to watch it. And you had to be there. And then you would sit down after they would skin it all up and do everything with the offal and all the, the fatty things. And, and you go read about it. It's like crazy. Then you would sit down. You would get your part back and you would have a fellowship meal with God. It would represent you being back in right fellowship with God while it covered you. And you would get your part. And you would be back having a meal. It's the, it's the, in the Bible, having a meal with God or having a meal with people was the most intimate thing you could do because they ate with their hands. You didn't just eat with anybody. We just cleaned it all up. Now we have forks and knives and all kinds of stuff. They would eat with their hands. And so living sacrifice, the problem, living sacrifices can get up. You have free will. That goat, it ain't getting back up. That lamb, cut it, it ain't getting back up. Life is in the blood. It's dead. You and I have a choice as a living sacrifice. And, and we were like, okay, Lord, here I am. Use me. Oh, wait a minute. I got some stuff to go do. And we get up and we run off. And then we go, oh, Lord, I ran off again, didn't I? Here I come back. Holy. Set apart. Holy. Be ye holy for he is ho or as he is holy. See, we're holy automatically because we belong to God. Acceptable to God. That's a different one, isn't it? You know what this word means, acceptable? It means fully agreeable, well-pleasing. This would be a place where you say acceptable to God. This is by faith because without faith, it's impossible to please God. And this means to be well-pleasing. So, but we need to look at and say, what is it that is well-pleasing to God? Well, he's gonna address that as we're living sacrifices, we're holy, we're trying to be well-pleasing to God. It's our reasonable service. It's the only reasonable thing we can do. And do not be conformed to this world. Do you understand that that's what the school systems wanna do? I, I don't think most people understand that. That the systems of this world want to conform you to their world. Do you understand that Facebook right now, Facebook just made a new thing where if, if you're up on the right, if you're in the light and you want to share something about ISIS or share something about evil, you can't even share it anymore. Go try to share it. They shut it down. But if you're on the left and you want to share all the good things about Islam and all the good things about the devil, they let you share them with everybody. But they're stopping. They, have, they call it hate crimes. And they're the ones that get to decide what is hate crime. And they're choosing that all that is good is a hate crime. And all that is bad, you get a share. Because they're indoctrinating a planet. Facebook, YouTube, all of them are doing it now. And that's, that's just part of what's going on. I mean, uh, the, the former Muslim who was our president didn't give away the whole internet rights to, to other people just because he felt like it. He did it on purpose so that the devil and the powers to be can begin to, 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 to train us more like the Pied Piper rats that are following all one voice. When they play the music, we go. 
That's why it was so important that we present our bodies and we begin to listen to God. And we're not being conformed to this world. We're being conformed into the image of Jesus. And when the man of God looks into the word of God and sees the son of God, he's transformed by the spirit of God into the image of God for the glory of God. See, that's what we want to be. Not conformed to this world, but conformed into the image of the living God. But be transformed, metamorpho. It's the word used uh, of a, of a um, caterpillar changing into that new creation and becoming a butterfly. Okay? We were caterpillars. We came to Jesus. And now we're butterflies. We were metamorpho. We're being transformed. Well, how are you doing that? By the renewing of your mind. Listen, and if you're just letting the world still have your mind, your mind's not being renewed. You're still being conformed. The only way to renew your mind is to enter into God's school. Enter into God's education system. Enter into truth 101. Allow the Holy Spirit to wash and cleanse you through the washing of the water with the word. Go back to the cross and say, Lord Jesus. I need to understand the power of your cross. And then you're renewed. You're renewing your mind. Why do we need new minds? Because the old ones were washed in evil. The old ones were the old nature. And now we have a new nature. Well, what's my new nature do? It begins to listen to the teaching of the Holy Spirit. It begins to listen to the word of God. It begins to say, oh, I'm not supposed to do that. The word of God says I should do this. And you're being transformed practically. Positionally finished. Practically we begin to be transformed. According to God's kingdom. Not according to the world. Because some people can turn into be butterflies. And they can't even get off the ground. They're still a caterpillar. They're still stuck in their little cocoon. They can't get up. They're like the moth going like this. Seriously. Because they're not listening. They're trying to use their own works. They're trying to use religious systems and tradition and programs and everything except for the Spirit of God with the Word of God and the power of God at the cross. And so they go, I'm a butterfly. No, you're not. I'm a butterfly. No, you're not. Listen to me. Renew your mind with the Word of God. It needs to be washed. But well, what happens then? You will prove what is that good and acceptable and perfect will of God. Well, how will we do that? Because you'll be the living evidence. As your mind is renewed, you become the evidence. You're the proof that there's a living God. You're the proof that there's a good living God. You're the proof that there's a will. You're the proof right there. You'll be on display in front of everybody. I was listening today when they had the trials, the civil trials, Back in biblical times, they didn't go in a courtroom like we do and, and limit it to a few people. They went out in the middle of the city, the marketplace. Listen, they want people to see their example. They want them to prove the good and acceptable and perfect will of God. It doesn't happen unless you let God renew your mind. Everything was done in the public square. And as Christians, it should be done in the public square so people will see that there's a living and true God. And they'll say, those people are living by faith. Those people believe in a God. Those people are changing. Cannot just say a prayer and come to Jesus. I beseech you, brethren, consider the mercies of God that you present your bodies living sacrifices as Jesus did, although he did die. We're living sacrifices that are reckoning ourselves dead because of the power of the cross. We're crucified with him because one died, all died. And we present our bodies as those living sacrifices. And we ask the Holy Spirit to help us stay there, to stay in service. No matter how bad it gets, no matter how much it hurts, we know that we need to be those examples. Because we're not being conformed. We have to always be alert because it's easy to get conformed. To the world. Everybody else is doing it. Let's go do what they're doing. Oh, look, we're all selling chocolate now. Let's all go sell chocolate. Oh, look, we're all doing this now. Let's go do that now. And you get just sucked in. When you find yourself getting sucked in, go, wait a minute. Back to the cross. What am I supposed to be doing? I'm supposed to be having my mind renewed. My mind. My mind. Because that's where we go astray is in our mind. I think I should do this. I know this guy I talk to all the time. He goes, I'm feeling like uh, we should be. And I'm like, why do you keep saying that? 
It's not about your feelings. What's the truth? I'm feeling like they don't. It, no, they do know. And it just drives me crazy. But that's how we're training the millennials. We've sucked the foundation from millennials away. And they're conformed to the world and the systems of the world. And they have no foundation of God whatsoever because we took it out of the schools. We took it out of our public squares where it's supposed to be. It used to be right in the middle of the public square. And now we pushed it into these little bitty buildings that don't even have stained glass windows anymore. They're just little buildings. You can't even tell they're a church because nobody wants to know. We need to wake up, people. We're apostate. Sorry. Are you living a life that proves the good and acceptable? There it is. Acceptable. The good and the agreeable, well-pleasing will of God. The perfect will of God. That's our aim. That's our target. Let's go to Judges. What is that? Romans what? 12, 1 and 2. A great scripture. Great scripture. I love it. I you were love saying it. about the churches. I heard that on the radio today. Did you? Yeah. What did you hear it on? That AFR, I think. What about it? Uh, they were talking about how churches used to be huge and elaborate and beautiful. Oh, yeah. That That's was Francis Schaeffer's book is what they were talking about. Kind of the point of a church. Mm -hmm. And now it's little bitty churches with huge parking lots. You can't tell it's a church. They're the ugliest looking things half the time. In the Old Testament, the tallest building, the temple was supposed to be the taller. There is in God, but they tear down the high places. You know that color high places? Because they, they would make them with a pole on them that they'd be higher than the temple of God. And it meant that they looked at them as higher. You know, so that's why they would come in and they'd bring reform and they'd tear them all down. The church is supposed to be the, the, the spiritual hospital, the center of the city, the center of the most noticeable because we want to show the beauty of Christ. We want to show that beauty. But I think that there's a, 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 a divide there that we got to be careful on. We don't want to just waste all kinds of money so that we can be the most elaborate building. Uh, we want to make a building that, that honors God, but we don't need to hide the building. And I think much to our chagrin, we've decided that we need to hide the building so that people won't be afraid to come to it and they'll feel comfortable coming to it. And that's how you end up with a bunch of goat inside the building where the sheep are supposed to be. And don't say that because people are like, you can't judge them. You can't call them goats. But Jesus did. Well, you can't judge somebody's salvation. I'm not. Jesus just said there's going to be a whole bunch of goats in there. Don't try to pull them out. So we're not trying to judge them. But we just need to get a balance of this and, and understand most of all, the same lesson we're learning in Judges chapter 17, that we're apostate. The church is apostate. I start, I'm i starting to hear a lot more teachers on the radio, though. They're going, the church is apostate. They're, we're going into apostasy. I'm like, I've been preaching this for 10 years. We have been apostate. We're not going into it. Wake up. We're apostate. The church is apostate. The church is worried about its own business plans its own budget the churches are only worried about their own buildings and it's supposed to be a body of christ that's out with the word of reconciliation to see people's souls saved and i think the church actually thinks i think we think that our evangelistic program is better than god's i think the church thinks that if they do a good uh, a children's ministry and and, and a excellent morning uh, worship team and a great presentation of a, of a five-point sermon or whatever points they teach you in cemetery they, they if they do all of that they're going to win a bunch of people to jesus when in fact the only people that the only way we can win people to jesus is be the church and let the holy spirit bring people to christ and god has given us some simple practical things to do and that is to go out and share the gospel and if you have to use words it really comes down to living it with our lives we're living stones that should be living sacrifices so that we would be the evidence that there's a living god in us and that we've been to the cross and we have died to our own will and we're allowing the cross to live through us the power of the finished work of the cross so remember we've been through this we've had we've had these uh, judges raised up which means deliverers it means saviors 
Okay, that's what they were. They were they would they would go apostate. The nation would ignore God, do their own thing. They were supposed to be they were supposed to be doing the work uh, that God called them to do. They were supposed to be killing all the ites in the land. They were supposed to be dividing up the territory. Everybody finding their place and taking care as good stewards of their land and making sure that people come to know the God of the Bible, the God uh, that that brought them there and brought them out of Egypt and into the land of milk and honey. And what did they do? They just got there and settled down and started eating and forgot God. They become comfortable, complacent, and content, and it caused confusion. And we're going to find the testimony becomes there was no king, so everyone did what was right in their own eyes. We're going to find that that becomes a testimony. But every time they would go apostate, which means falling away from the faith, faith in what? Faith in God's provision, faith in what God had given them, faith in what God had asked them to do, faith in where God was leading them. It was trusting God that every time they would come back to God and he would raise up a deliverer, but they would be more morally depraved. They would be worse off morally because their values had lowered. Then they cry out to God. Then they come back, their values lower. Then they cry out to God, their values lower. And they keep going down this, this reprobate ladder morally. The moral decline was just going down, down, down. They were going into idolatry. And you know, you would think, as we closed out chapter 16, Samson pushed the pillars, died, killed more people in his death than he did in his life spiritual lesson you want to help souls die be crucified with christ listen he killed all the leaders that were celebrating he delivered the nation from the philistines because all the leaders were dead but he did not deliver the nation from its moral decline from its depravity from its idolatry he just killed some people that were ruling over them and that was even in the strength of God. So as we watch this, we're going to see now, and it's really strange. We've seen 16 chapters of apostasy and return to God, apostasy, return to God. Now they're going to go buck wild. There you guys know that term, buck wild. Because apostasy... To apostasy leads to a downward spiral of man into this uh, and, and immorality. And where do they end up at? They're going to end up in man-made religion, which completely leaves God out. Isn't that what we've been warned about in the New Testament? A form of godliness which denies the power thereof. Denies God. That's a form of godliness that denies the power of the cross. It's a form of godliness that denies that God delivered us from the old nature so that we can walk in the newness of life. And we just deny it and we keep living in the old nature and say, I'm saved. I'm a Christian. And we keep living in the old nature and say, oh, it's all right. People sin. It's no big deal. And we walk away from God and we end up in moral decay. Think about it. If the children of Israel did it, and this is all written for our examples, then why would the church not be doing it? Some 2,000 plus years after Christ, why would we not be doing it? And it's pretty amazing. I was, I was kind of studying this, and I was like, oh, I think I knew this, but I didn't really get this. Because, you know, in the Old Testament, it tells us that God gives us leaders according to our hearts. See, we think that, and this is the way we look at it, because here's what I was telling some people today. Everything that we do, we're looking at it from man's perspective. We're looking at it, looking up to God, like, what are you going to give me? But as new creations, we're now citizens in heaven, and we need to start looking at the things going on around us like we're in heaven looking down at it. From heaven's perspective, look at it from what God is thinking, what God is doing, because it's all about God. He's the center of it, and he's given us his grace and mercy. He's pouring out his love upon us. We don't deserve any of it. Listen to me. Because we look at what's going on, and the government's caused this, leaders have caused this. We look and think that our cities are bad because of the city council. Our cities are really horrible because of the state government. 
things are just deteriorating in our communities because we had a president who was a Muslim. I'm sorry, you can't say that, can you? I can. He said the future does not belong to us. It belongs to the prophet Muhammad. And the only people that say that's Muslims. I don't care what anybody says. So we'll just put that out there and there it is. Truth sets you free. Listen to me. Listen to me. Our government didn't go bad and then make the people bad. See, apostasy always starts when you take God out and ignore him and you don't believe what he says. Apostasy starts when you remove the word of God and the truth of God. And that's when you remove that, you remove it from your heart and my heart. And the people go astray in their heart. And that is where it goes upward. Then it goes up to the city council. Then it goes up to the state government. Then it goes up to the political leaders. It doesn't come down. It's when the people walk away from God that you put leaders in that have bad morals. And God gives you a leader after your own heart. So when you see the political decay of a nation or the leader's decay, that's the last step of apostasy. The first step is when the church walks away from God and they stop being the church. The first step was when the nation of Israel walked away from God. They stopped being the people that were delivered out of Egypt and come through the Red Sea and trusted God so that they can cross the Jordan. They stopped being those people that trusted God and it turned into moral decay. Then they say, oh, wait a minute, we've forgotten our God. And they cried back out, and he raises up a deliverer. And the same thing is going on with the church. The church is supposed to be the sinner. The church is the spiritual hospital. The church is the pillars of the community. You used to have to be an elder in your church in order to even run for office. And not that it's horrible, but I just heard of a story where the mayoral race in a city in the I think it's Detroit. They got like 10 or 12 people running for mayor and over half of them have felony convictions. Now I'm just saying, I, I, I'm a felon myself. But when a society goes from most people are pastors who run for office, they know the word of God, they have a foundation, they're able to keep the morals of society going all the way to the other side where it doesn't matter who gets in office as long as you make the money work, as long as you get us our money, as long as we get our stuff. It's okay, just get in office, but you, we can't take no more of these people. Well, you're just putting worse and worse people in because we're in apostasy. But it started with man's heart. It started in the church sanctuary. It didn't start in Washington, D.C. with the politicians. We began to elect people who forgot God, and so our nation forgot God. We began to elect people who didn't care about God and were godless. We began to believe people who did not know God, and we let them enter into our education system. It's all across the board. We began to teach psychology instead of Christianity. And all the psychologists and the behavioralists, if you just go look, they were all godless men, not God-fearing men. They were all led by the devil. And then we go, how did our society get there? Well, because we started listening to the devil and quit listening to God. Now watch. Chapter 17. Let me say this, because when somebody says to you, well, I feel like we should, and I, I sincerely believe, listen, you can sincerely believe all you want. If it doesn't line up with the truth of God, you're sincerely wrong. Remember that, <clears throat> remember that. The little example I give all the time that Johnny goes to school and he gets his paper back from his math quiz and it's like an F. I sincerely thought these were the right answers. Why would I get an F? I thought this was good. I feel like these are the right answers. You flunked math. What about eternity? 
We can't be sincerely thinking that our feelings are right when the truth of God says no. God has told us the truth, and we have to willingly, by choice, say no to God. That's what the fool has said, no God. That's literally what the Bible says. Not there is no God. The fool has said no God. <coughs> Not listening to you. You have to willfully do that. And when you look at the truth and it says don't do that. And you go, I'm going to do it anyway. Then you're saying no to God. And that's what the church is doing today. Over and over and over again. Because we have a better plan. And Jesus said, I will build my church and the gates of hell will not prevail against it. He doesn't need us to build his church. He needs us to be his church. He does the work. Now there was a man from the mountains of Ephraim whose name was Micah. Now you remember Ephraim. Ephraim was the firstborn of Jacob. Jacob had two sons, Ephraim and Manasseh. They both got his double portion of inheritance. Genesis 49, I think it is. And this is where Ephraim's inheritance was at. And there's a man that was there named Micah. I really thought I tried to find the name of it. I didn't get enough study in. I wanted to see what his name meant, but it just didn't say much. But there's a prophet. We have a prophet Micah, but it just said Micah, a name in the Bible. And he said to his mother, notice who he's talking to, his mother, the 1,100 shekels of silver that were taken from you and on which you put a curse, even saying it in my ears, here is the silver with me, I took it. Now I'm like, what? Listen, remember I told you, apostasy, apostasy, deliverance, deliverance, apostasy. Now we're way down here. What do we have? We have a, a young man stealing from his mom 1,100 pieces of silver, right? Now, I just got to tell you, silver is the, 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 the metal. The silver is redemption. It means redemption. Just, just let me throw that out there. I don't know where it's going to go to. Maybe God will go sow something in here with us. But evidently, here's this kid dishonoring his parent, right? He's dishonoring his parent. He stole from her, right? Dishonor. We can agree that, right? Is it, what is it? The fifth commandment? Honor their father and their mother. It's the first commandment with a promise that you will live long in the land. And he's not honoring them. So he's obviously breaking the commandments. This is where he's at. Took money from his mom, 1,100 pieces of silver. Now listen, this hits me right in the belly because I took money from my mom. I was a heathen. I was a heathen. I mean, I even went to where my mom worked her butt off to take care of six kids and go get her check and pick it up and go cash it and spend it all on dope. That's how much of a heathen I was. Oh, yeah. I was a heathen. Do something like that to your own family, to your own mom? My sin is no worse than your sin. My sin just looks bad on me. We all need a Savior at the cross. And she pronounces this curse. Whoever took my money, they'll be cursed by God. Whoever took my money, may they rot in hell. I don't know what kind of a curse it was. Maybe their leg rots off and they fall down on their other knee. I don't know. But she pronounced some type of a curse. You know, we're all born under a curse because of our sin. And we need redemption. And the only redeemer, the only deliverer that's coming already came. It was Jesus. And that's the only way to be redeemed from our sin, whether you steal from your mother or steal from somebody else. You're under a curse. You're born with that old nature that's a sin nature that is a cursed nature that will go to hell if you do not have it interrupted by a new birth with a new nature and become a new creation because of what Christ did with his blood on the cross. So he fesses up. She pronounces a curse and maybe he felt guilty and he goes, okay, mom, I did it. I did it. I did it, mom. Here it is. And his mother said, may you be blessed by the Lord, my son. What? Now think about it just for a minute. Now it could be, because it, it, see, because the cross, redemption, curse, takes repentance. Right? Here he comes, repenting because of the curse. 
He's turning and saying, Mom, I did it. I'm sorry. Here's my here's the money back. That's what you and I, it's the first word of the gospel. Jesus said, repent. It's not about this. said, repent. It means to turn, not just turn from your sin, but turn to a living God. Turn to the power of the cross. But think about it long and hard. Where's mom's morals at? If her money was stolen by her son, instead of disciplining the brat, she said, oh, may you be blessed to the Lord for giving my money back. Where's the spanking? How old is he? Where's the, where's the life lesson here? I mean, there really needs to be some other dialogue here. If he stole 1,100 pieces of silver from mom and he just brings it back and there's nothing that happens. There's no discipline. That's just my opinion. The Lord's going to bless you now. You stole my money, but you brought it back, so the Lord bless you, she says. So when he had returned the 1,100 shekels of silver to his mother, his mother said, watch what his mother said, I had wholly dedicated the silver from my hand to the Lord for my son to make a carved image and a molded image. Now, therefore, I will return it to you. She, she was saving the money, 1,100 pieces of silver. She was going to give it to her son and have her son get a molded image or a carved image. Now, do you understand where her morals are at at the end of this apostasy after apostasy after apostasy? Because, look at Exodus 20. What did God say? See, they're so far from God's word. What do you think is going on? And now they were under law, in this law. This was the Ten Commandments of the law. They knew what they were supposed to be doing when they started into this. Now they are so confused and so gone because they won't listen to the word of God. Look at this. Let's just look. It's, it's um, Exodus chapter 20, verse 1. And God spoke all these words, saying, I am, here's the testimony of God. I am ego or not ego of me but it's just the i am the becoming one the lord your god who brought you out of the land of egypt what did he just say i am the god who delivered you that's what we need to remember when we're in our sin that christ is the only one that delivered us Salvation in no other name. And the word salvation means deliverance. Well, what did he deliver us from? He delivered us from the power of darkness. He delivered us from the penalty of sin. He delivered us from the penalty that was on the sin nature. The penalty that was on our old nature. Listen to me. And the power of the old nature. Because the power of the old nature was put in the grave with Christ. The entire old age, you became a new creation. You're now the new commander in chief. It's not the devil, he's not your father anymore. It's, it's the creator of the universe. And he gave you a new spirit and a new heart and a new nature. All things have become new, and he's saying it's there, it's positionally done, and now practically renew your mind. Everything that you were taught under the old nature is trash. Everything you learned under the old nature, the father of all lies was teaching you. It's time to wake up and learn truth because we're living in a lie. I know, that sounds really hard. You mean everything's a lie? My mom's name's really not? No. No, there's some things that are still there. But how do you divide them? By letting the Spirit of God lead you as you walk in the newness of life and you get into the Word of God and the throne room of God and you spend time with God and you learn to be dependent upon God for all of life and godliness. Not dependent upon self, not dependent upon the world, not dependent upon what the devil's still doing. That would be conformed to this world, but we're going to be dependent upon what God did on the cross when he delivered us from that old nature, when he delivered us from the nature that was blind and couldn't see. Remember the guy said, I was once blind, but now I see. See, our old nature was under a curse. It was blind. It couldn't see spiritual truth. The new nature can be renewed right here. 
You don't have to choose to keep doing those things you did. You don't have to keep going to them places you went. And listen to the testimony. He's the God who brought you out of the old nature. The old house, the old place you live. Here it's called Egypt. Out of the house of bondage. Where was you at? Bondage to darkness. Where was you at? You had a house. You had a house, a nature that was in the bondage of darkness. Listen. And now it's been set free. And you have a new nature that's in the light. That can walk in the newness of life. That can listen to the Holy Spirit. That can grasp spiritual truth and tell others about it. He's the God that did that. He did it to them using Moses, who was a type of Christ, that drawed them out and led them out. And with you and I, he did it with the cross of Christ as we believe the cross because of the Spirit of God who opens our eyes and brings us to that cross, to that place where we say, I see it. I trust it. And God has delivered me from this bondage of my old nature. That was the house you lived in. Your spirit was in that nature. Your spirit was in that house. It was the devil's house. It was the devil's nature. And now you got a new house. Remember Jesus said this. We talked about this on Sunday morning. Let not your heart be troubled. It's John 14. You believe in God. Believe also in me. In my Father's house are many mansions. If it were not true, I would not have told you. But where I go, I go to prepare a place for you that where I am, you may be. I'm coming back, he says in John 14 there, to take us to where he's at. But it's a new house. He's already given it to us positionally. Practically, we're putting it on. Practically, we're learning it. Practically, this new house that we live in is where our spirit is living. See, they were in bondage down in Egypt. Their spirit was, was, was quenched. Their spirit was dead because they didn't know where God was. Why are we in bondage? We're the people of God. And they grew to millions of people to where the bondage became more and more because the Pharaoh, who's the type of the devil, didn't want them to see the truth and live freely for God, even though they were on the planet. And it's the same thing with you and I. The devil doesn't want us to see truth. He wants to keep us in bondage in our house. Where does he want to keep us? Living in our old nature. Living according to the flesh. Living according to the dictates of this world. Living according to the lie. But Christ set us free. The cross gives us a new nature. What Christ has set free is free indeed. You know what? They never did wake up to this. Remember John 8, 31 and 32? Jesus said to those, who, those disciples who believed... If you abide in my word, that means live in my word. That's his house. If you abide in my word, you are my disciples indeed, and you will know the truth, and the truth shall set you free. The Pharisees and them looking on said, we've never been in bondage to anyone. They didn't learn it. That's what we say. That's what you present the cross to somebody and say, look to the cross, look to the power of the cross. They go, I'm not in bondage. Yes, you are. He goes on to talk about it in John 8 there. For whoever you serve, you're a slave to that. And if you're serving sin, you're a slave to sin. But Christ set us free. We're new natures. The Spirit of God doesn't serve sin. The Spirit of God isn't a slave to sin. And if we're walking in the newness of life, we won't be in bondage to sin. That's why we have to look to the cross. You shall have no other gods before you. Listen, no other gods. What's that mean, no other? None. God's the only God. He is the one that died on a cross for his people. We need to make sure he's first in everything. And then when we're not, we need to repent and come back and say, Lord, you need to be first in everything. You shall not make for yourself a carved image. That's what I was trying to get to for you. But we had to go through the other places to get there because they're over here saving their money. The son steals it. He says, oh, mom, I'm sorry. Here's it back. And we didn't even see him say that. I'm just saying he kind of did. He gave it back. And she says, oh, good, son. Thank you so much because I was saving that to make a carved image. And I was going to have you do it. See where apostasy takes you? How far is it away from the very ten rules that God gave them? Oh, it's ten now. Remember, it was one in the garden. 
Of every tree in the garden you may freely eat, but you cannot eat of this one of the knowledge of good and evil, for in that day you shall surely die. We don't believe you. Why? Because the devil beguiled them. Now we walk up here. He delivers them. He brings them. Takes them across the Jordan. They go apostate, apostate, apostate. Unbelief in God's word and what he's doing. They didn't go do the work that he called them to do because they didn't believe him. Now all they did was said, get rid of the ice. And God said, go ahead and go in and take your land. I just gave it to you. Oh, there's giants there. Go take your land. I just gave it to you. Ah. And then they got comfortable. Listen to me. All you have to do is believe God. He gave us an inheritance. He set us free. The old nature's dead. It's buried. It stinks. It's in the grave. Don't let it get up. Just walk in the newness. Just ask him. When you let it get up, you go, oh, that was real stupid. That's all flesh. That's all stinks. That's the old nature. I can tell because it has nothing to do with God. Say, Lord, would you put that back in the grave? Because I have no power to crucify it. But you did. You died. You rose again. You crucified the flesh. If one died, all died. Just remind yourself and remind the devil of the truth. And then ask God to move you into the newness of life. And then let him. And it takes time. We're going to get there sometime soon. Sometime soon. Where he says in Hebrews, you have need of endurance. That's what they lacked here in the wilderness. They didn't have any endurance. They didn't keep doing the right thing. They did the right thing, the right thing, the right thing, and they thought, ah, let's get comfortable, complacent. Let's get content with where we're at, and then let's let the devil pour confusion upon us, and we'll go back to doing what we were doing. But you need endurance. You abide under the things that are going on. Sure, you might fight the same battle for a year, two years, three years. You might fight it for 10 years. But God's going to come through because he promised you victory. He's going to defeat it. You have to keep fighting the battle. And he's going to test you to see if you will. He's going to test you to see if you'll keep coming back to truth or you'll go to sleep. Which one are you going to do? You're going to sleep to sleep at that? Are you going to go to sleep and say, well, God must not be going to heal that. God must not be going to do that. Or are you going to keep believing him and walk by faith? Don't make any carved image. Any likeness of anything that is in heaven above or that is in the earth beneath or that is the water under the earth, you shall not bow down to them nor serve them. For I, the Lord your God, am a jealous God, visiting the iniquity of the fathers upon the children of the third and fourth generation of those who hate me. Do you notice that? Qualifier, 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 qualifier. He does visit the iniquity upon the generations of those who hate him. Watch the other qualifier. But showing mercy. Mercy. Don't you want mercy? To thousands, to those who love me. If you love me, keep my commandments. Mercy to those who love me and keep my commandments. They're not burdensome. They're, oh, listen, listen, no, listen, let me say that again. They're not burdensome if you do it with the Spirit's power, with the power of the cross. They are burdensome if you try to keep his commandments in the flesh and let the old nature get out of the grave and go, I'm going to do this with the old nature. That becomes religion, and religion is just stinks. Religion makes you pretend. Religion makes you fake it. And that's what happens when you try to do it with your own works in the flesh. You have to put the old nature and reckon it dead and remember that it's dead and then ask God to do the work in the newness of life with the spirit of God by the power of God that was poured out at the cross. Listen to what I'm saying to you. It's, it's not new. It's all over the pages of scripture. But we're just not preaching it and we're not talking about it. What's the other one say? You shall not take the name of the Lord your God in vain, for the Lord will not hold him guiltless who takes his name in vain. Bear not cuss. That's not what that means. Vain means empty. In other words, I'm a Christian, and then your life is empty and devoid of the newness of life. It's taking God's name, his character, his nature, and his will, his provision, and, and living an empty life. And you will be guilty. You'll still be guilty, and you will feel the guilt if you don't let the Spirit of God renew your mind so you can prove what is that good and acceptable and perfect will of God. So 
So don't make carved images. That's what this is um, that's showing you where they went. Completely away from God. Completely away from God. Well, why couldn't you make an image? You know what he's talking about? You're talking about an invisible God who spoke and created the heavens and the earth, who, 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 who brought you out of the land of Egypt, and now we're going to make an image of him. Well, you can't see him. He's invisible. How are you going to make an image of him? See what I mean? And they're making an image. That's why he said don't make one. I think God looks like, I'm feeling like he really looks like this. You know, I mean, whatever it is. And then they take these gods and, and they go out and make them themselves. We're going to see it in the text. They cut down this tree and they go, oh, it's getting a little too dark. I've been cutting on this tree all day. Let me start a fire so I can see. And I'll cook some food while I'm doing it with this part of the tree. And then over here, I'm going to carve these little eyes. They can't see. And carve this nose. Look, can't smell. Carve this little mouth. They can't speak to me. I'm going to put some hands on it. It can't move. And then I'm going to bow down and worship it. And I just made the God. Do you understand what I'm saying? We do it every day. We do it all the time. In our flesh. The old nature. We make it up. I'm pleasing to God because I did this. When in fact, no. You can only be pleasing by believing in the finished works of Jesus on the cross. That's how you're pleasing to God. That's how you're acceptable. And now because of that, you, you the old nature's dead and you can walk in the newness of life. You can get up and, and he's freed you to follow him and tell other people about it. But our flesh keeps getting up and getting in the way. Go get that spirit down from here. We don't want to listen to that. That's not what everybody else is doing in the church. It doesn't matter what everybody else is doing. It matters what you're doing. Nobody else is going to stand at the throne room with you on Judgment Day. Look how far they've gone. All the way away from God. They're the complete opposite of what God wanted. Complete opposite. Don't make any graven image. Saving all my money to make a graven image so I can worship God. You see, they're all. The, it's funny, but it's true. And the church is the same way. That's why I call it culturanity. Now, there's always people following God, but it's the same thing. We have went all the way. We worship God in spirit and truth. And what are we doing? We're doing it the total opposite. Flesh and lies. Flesh and lies is how we're worshiping God in the church today because of the devil. Somebody got in and sold tears into the, the truth. And everything's being done by flesh, and you cannot finish in the flesh what God has started in the spirit. It has to be spirit because it's a new spirit. It's a new nature. We don't even consider anybody flesh and blood anymore, Paul said in that same text of 2 Corinthians 5. I think it was in 5.15. We don't even consider anything flesh anymore because now our eyes have been opened, and we know everything is about spirit. Spiritual God, spiritual kingdom, spiritual people, fallen spirits, fallen demons. It's, it, it, it's, it, it's all spiritual. It's got nothing to do with the flesh, and the flesh can only get in your way. The flesh can only deceive you and take you to hell. It's not about this material. It's about what God says, and this word is spirit. This word is truth, and you can only worship him in spirit and truth. And they went all the way to the other side. Don't make any molded image or card. Well, I was saving all my money for that. Why? When he said don't. Well, I just feel like it's the right thing to do. Well, it's not. So quit. It's that simple, but it's that hard too. Thus, she gives it back to him. He stole it from her. She pronounces a curse. He brings it to her. She pronounces a blessing upon him and said, I was saving it to give it to you so you can make us an image. So she gives it back to him. Thus he returned, thus he returned the silver to his mother. Then his mother took 200 shekels of silver and gave them to the silversmith. What? And he made it into a carved image and a molded image, and they were in the house of Micah. Listen, a couple things here. I wholly dedicated it to God for a molded image. And then she didn't give the, all of it to the, to the guy. She gave only, look at it. Do you see that? 200 shekels. What did she have stolen? 1,100 shekels. What did she wholly dedicate to God in verse 3? 1,100 shekels. What did she end up taking to? What she do with the other 900 shekels? Spend it on herself? 
Wait a minute, even if she was going to worship God with these standards, which are so wrong, she didn't even stay faithful to what she said. Are you with me on this? She couldn't even keep her own standards. Do you understand this is in the New Testament? I'm not going to go there. There's a parable where a, a, a man gave some talents to some people. And he went away. And he came back and he said, what would you do with my talent? And here's the thing. The one guy said, oh, I knew that you were uh, an exacting master. And you, 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 you got stuff where you did not sow. And, and, and I knew all these things about you. So I buried mine in the ground. And he said, you evil, wicked servant. Should you have not at least put it in the bank so I could have drawn interest? You know what he did? He judged that servant by what he thought he knew about God. And that's exactly what's going on here. Could not even keep her own standards. And that's what God's going to do with us. There's no wisdom and counsel against the Lord. And when we try to tell God some story about our life, and it doesn't line up with his truth, and we say, well, I thought that he said, you said, we said, and it couldn't do it like this, he's going to say, well, then why didn't you do it over here? If that was the truth and that was a good thing, then why didn't you follow it over here? If you really did holy to commit 11... Thousand or eleven hundred shekels to me, then why didn't you at least give the eleven hundred if it was for me to make them old an image? Do you understand what I'm saying? We're going to be judged by our own hearts and what we know, and that's why all you need to know is Christ crucified, and then begin to let God use your life, because you can't come up with some other thing and go, "I thought this about you, God." It was untrue, and then God still uses your thought of untrueness and judges you and shows you didn't even keep that standard. And that's what they did. They didn't even keep the standard. She didn't even send the 1,100 shekels for the image. Why didn't you give it all? And then it says, and they were in the house of Micah. Son's house. Parent was in the son's house, it looks like. But what's in your house? That's what I want to know physical house first because that's important like your house how many things are in there that don't line up with the word of God the truth of God the spirit of God the work of God the kingdom of God the things of God how many things are in your house that God would say what's that evil thing doing here and then your spiritual house your spiritual house your soul the middle of you what's in there what are we keeping in there that's all confused because of apostasy? Listen to me, people, listen to me, seriously. Listen to me. All you need to do is believe in the finished work of Jesus on the cross and you're saved. But because of apostasy, this went on and on and on, just like the nation of Israel did, the church is so far off the beaten path. They're so far away from the old paths that Isaiah talks about and the word of God. And we've made stuff and twisted it and conformed it in to make it look like what it does today. And we think this is the real way that we are supposed to be worshiping God. And it's been twisted into some religion that has nothing to do with the cross of Christ. It really doesn't. And I heard today somebody talking about the catchy cliche, if it's new, it's not from God, and if it's from God, it's not new. If somebody's teaching you something, that, he literally said, if somebody's teaching you something that doesn't line up with the past teachers and the norms of what they were teaching, then it's new and it's not from God. And I'm like, are you kidding me? That's what happened to the nation of Israel. They were teaching commentary after commentary. And Jesus showed up and said, hey, it's me. The lamb that takes away the sins of the world. And they go, kill him. They didn't even listen. It's if the Bible, listen, this is not new. This is the ancient of days. This is the ancient of days himself. If somebody gives you a new book, if somebody gives you a new gospel, don't get it. Don't take it.
But if the scriptures are being revealed to us and opened to us in the last days, which is the uncovering, then you better get it. If not, you'll stay in apostasy. You'll stay asleep. Drives me crazy what people say sometimes. I don't know where they get it at. And oh, get this first. Nobody's going to give you with perfectness the Bible except God. Okay? Not me, not anybody. Because none of us have completely crucified the old nature and keep it in the grave forever. It's only going to stay in the grave forever when we see Christ face to face. So you need to be a Berean. If I misquote something or say something wrong, you need to be a Berean. It's a personal love relationship. Where you don't need anybody to teach you. You have the Holy Spirit whom Christ sent back. When he said, I'll send you another. The Holy Spirit will teach you. So nobody's perfect in teaching. We're all trusting God and walking by faith and trying to let the Spirit of God reveal to us what the Bible is saying and has always said. You don't have to twist it to make it fit. All we have to do is read it and live it. Where are we at? What's in our house? Verse 5. The man Micah had a shrine. You ever go in them houses like that? That's just real spooky to me. And made an ephod and household idols, and he consecrated one of his sons, you, you hear with me, who became his priest. Now, Micah got a son. He's like, I got a shrine. Let me set up some really fancy stuff over here that looks religious and some household idols, right? An ephod, remember the vest that the priest would wear. He made, he, and then he made his son the priest. You just make him a priest. Okay, you're a priest. Come here. Under the law, you had the only way you could be a priest is if you was from the tribe of Levi or Aaron. The Levites were priests, and Aaron was the high priest, and everybody that followed him became the next high priest. Okay? You couldn't just take anybody and go, hey, come here, Danite. These, are, these guys are Danites, by the way. The Danites are the ones. Samson was a Danite. He was the last of the judges. And he, they're the first one to lead people astray away from what? Well, anybody know what? The salvation of the Lord. The Danites led the people away from true deliverance from the Lord. And it's the same thing going on in the church today. They lead, we're leading, the Danites are leading people away from the true worship of the Lord. Where did I get that from? Go back to Genesis chapter 49. I'll show you exactly where I got it from. It's uh, Genesis 49, 16, and 17. Dan shall judge his people... As one of the tribes of Israel, listen, it's it, 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 one of the tribes of governed by God, Dan shall be a serpent by the way and a viper by the path that bites the horse's heels so that the rider shall fall backward. You ever heard of backsliding? You ever heard of going away from God? That's what Dan began to do. Look what it says, though, in verse 18. I have waited for your salvation, O Lord. That's what, that's what the Danites do. That's what religion does. That's what ignoring God's word does. It leads you away. It's a viper on the path. It, it, it bites the horses here. What's the horse power? It takes away the power. Listen to me. I have waited for your deliverance, O Lord. That's what we're waiting on. That's why we need endurance. There's things in your life right now you're dealing with, and you need to wait. For that deliverance. It's coming. Believe me. It's right around the corner. Don't give up. It's coming. Don't give up. But the Danites, they did that. There's Danites in the world today. They, they're deceiving and being deceived. And they continue to teach. They continue to be a viper, a serpent. Biting the power of the gospel. By the way they live. By the way they teach. By, by, by the things they trust in. By the world they're being conformed to. They're making their own shrines. They're making their own ephods. They're making their, their own household idols. And then they consecrate somebody. That's setting them apart. Only God can consecrate something. I mean, you can consecrate. Okay, I'm going to consecrate this money for God. You can set it apart in that sense. You'll become his priest. 
Oh my goodness. Why did they do all of this? Oh, verse 6. In those days, talking about them old good old days, ain't we? Those days there was no king in Israel. Everyone did what was right in his own eyes. In those days there was no king in those governed by God. Oh, let's look at it that way. We believe in Jesus and Christ in us and we're in Christ. But is there a king in those who are governed by God? Is there a king in your life? King Jesus? He's the king of kings and the Lord of lords. Listen, he's also the priest forever according to the order of Melchizedek. He's the one we're to listen to. His power, what he did on the cross, not what somebody else is saying. We look to him. See, in these days, a prophet would represent God to the people. God would speak to him. He'd come and tell the people what God's saying. So he represented God to the people. A priest would represent the people to God. You go, a priest would be the intermediary. Go to, go to God and go, okay, here's a sacrifice because the people have sinned. See what I mean? He would go, go take people back and plead for them. But a king ruled over them. A king would rule over them. And here... It says no king in Israel, right? Because they had judges. We're moving into the age of kings here. Pretty soon Saul's going to be king. No king. Nobody to tell him what to do. So everybody did what was right in their own eyes. They did what we're doing today. Oh, it's right. exactly what we're doing today. It's called cultural relativism. Oh, well, that might be your truth, but it's not my truth. That might be how you feel about that, but it's not mine. That might be what you think, Greg. But that's not what I think. Well, then you think you're ready for apostasy. Well, you think you're ready for the grave and for death. We're talking about the Word of God. Not what Greg says, but what the Word of God says. And the reason the church is apostate is because there's no king in these days. And everyone's doing what's right in their own eyes. Instead of following the truth of God's Word, we're just doing what we think is right in our own eyes. I feel like I'll just go down to that church. Why? Oh, their children's ministry is a little better. Oh, really? Are they teaching the Word of God? I'm not sure uh, what they're teaching, but um, really? Do what's right in your own eyes. Forget about God's eyes. Forget about the loving favor of God's eyes leading and guiding you and directing you. <clears throat> what is that? Psalms 32, 8. Psalms 32, 8. I will instruct you and teach you in the way you should go. I will guide you with my eye. Do not be like the horse, like the mule, which have no understanding, which must be harnessed with a bit and a bridle, else they will not come near you. Many sorrows shall be to the wicked, but he who trusts in the Lord, mercy, mercy shall surround him. Listen, part of God's mercy is the grace of God that brings salvation. He's appeared. He's Jesus Christ. He died on a cross. <clears throat> Be glad in the Lord and rejoice, you righteous, and shout for joy, all you upright <clears throat> in heart. Cannot do what's right in our own eyes. That's why I tell you that the American dream is diametrically opposed to the gospel. And I know I'll get in trouble with that every time I say it. But it teaches us to be independent. It teaches us to be free thinkers. It teaches us this cultural relativism. It teaches us that we can do these things. And it doesn't teach us to do them with Christ, in Christ, because of Christ, and because of the cross of Christ. It teaches us to do them so that we can get our own. It teaches us to do them in the flesh so that we can leave a name for ourselves. And the only name we should be concerned about is Christ Jesus our Lord. Amen. 
Now there was a young man. Now the story story's going to shift. This is what's going on now. There's a son of Micah who's being a priest. He's doing these things because, hey, ain't nobody telling me what else to do. I can do things what's right in my own eyes. This looks like the way to God since nobody's telling me how to do it. Watch what happens. We're going to quit here in a second. Now there was a young man from Bethlehem. You know what Bethlehem means? House of bread. In Judah, Judah means praise, of the family of Judah. He was a Levite and was staying there. Wasn't his home. He's just staying there. The man departed from the city of Bethlehem in Judah to stay wherever he could find a place. Then he came to the mountain of Ephraim to the house of Micah as he journeyed. Listen, that's where I was in my spiritual walk. I was just staying places. I, I wasn't, I just departed. I'd go here, I'd go there. I was looking for a place to stay. I was looking for a house. And I found one. I found God's house. Listen, have you found God's house? He just journeying. We need to know that this is our house, that God's prepared a house for us, that he's coming back to take us home, that our spirit's going to live in his house. And Micah said to him, where do you come from? I could take that so many places. So he said to him, I am a Levite from Bethlehem in Judah, and I am on my way to find a place to stay. Listen, he's a Levite. Those are the people that are priests. The Levites, they're supposed to be serving in the temple. Micah said to him, Stay in my house, dwell with me, and be a father and a priest to me. See, Mike has already introduced this insanity. He's made his son a priest. Now he found somebody else. He's just making people priests. At least now he's getting closer. And I will give you 10 shekels. going to pay him. It's a hireling. Don't, you better be careful with hirelings. I'm telling you right now. If I ever start doing my job as a pastor here because I'm a hireling because I get paid for it, you might want to go somewhere else. I'm just saying. A hireling flees when the wolf comes. A hireling flees when trouble comes. I'm just saying. If you're there for a job, if you're there for a job, you better be careful with that pastor. I don't care what anybody says. I'd love to, I'd love to be paid to do what I do and not have to work and break my back. But if I have a heart of a hireling, you better flee. Because the hireling doesn't care about the sheep. Give you 10 shekels of silver per year. I don't know what the math is. Because if you take 1,100 shekels and take two, and then we got 10 shekels. It's all, it's all false redemption. A suit of clothes and your sustenance. So food, shelter, and clothing. A little bit of money to stipend to live off of. So the Levite went in. I mean... Looks like a good deal. I think I'll just take it. Better know where you're getting your redemption from. Better be at the cross. Better be the deliverance that comes from Christ from the old nature. Then the Levite was content to dwell. See, he's dwelling in this house with the man. And the young man became like one of his sons to him. He made one son like that. Now he's got another son. I don't know if the other guy's still priest or not. So Micah consecrated the Levite. How is Micah going to consecrate a Levite? How do you like consecrate his own son? This is insanity. How does the board of a church consecrate a pastor? By handing them a stack of canned sermons. That's how they do it. We're going to give you a paycheck and these canned sermons. You better teach what we told you to teach. Oh, boy, I'm not going to be a nice, happy person, am I? People are going to be mad at me. <laughs> So Micah consecrated the Levite. Only God can consecrate somebody as a priest or a believer. And the young man became his priest and lived in the house of Micah. You know, a lot of people are living in a fleshly house now instead of in the house of God. Then Micah said, Now I know that the Lord will be good to me since I have a Levite as a priest. We're going to close here. First, he had his son, and it probably didn't work out real good because he was the boss of his son, right? So he probably told the priest what to do all the time. Now he's got a Levite. Oh, boy. Because now he knows some other spiritual truths. He's been, he's woke up, hadn't he? 
He knows Levites are supposed to be priests. So now he's awakened and he thinks, God will be good to me now because I have a Levite, a token Levite. Our church will grow now. We got a hired pastor. Oh boy, I'm in trouble. Doesn't Christ grow the church? I will build my church. Listen. Again, it looks back to the works of the flesh. It looks back to God will be good to me now because I did such and such and thus and thus. I went to church, so God's going to be good to me now. I got me a Levite, so God's going to be good to me. It's the works of the flesh. It's cultural relativism hidden behind religion and disguised as good. And it's really nothing but the flesh that's supposed to be dead. Nothing that you do saves you or sanctifies you or is going to get you glory, glorified, which is the final of our salvation, our deliverance that comes from the cross. They may be things that are a part of it, but if you do them yourself thinking you're going to be consecrated because you have a Levite hanging out with you, I was over at the pastor's house, now I'm saved. I helped the pastor paint his house, now I'm more saved. I read my Bible, now I'm saved again. Listen, that's the mentality we have in the culture today. That's religion. That's flesh. <clears throat> Believe in the cross of Christ and you shall be saved. But God's will doesn't stop there. It moves on to where you're transformed by the renewing of the mind. You're being conformed into the image of Jesus. That's why we were delivered from the old nature so that he could conform us into that image. And then one day glorify us with him, which is when he'll complete the work he started in us. The day we see Christ Jesus, Philippians 1.6. Don't ever think that because of what you're doing, you're saved. Because you believe in the finished work of the cross, you're walking in and looking to walk in the works that Christ has laid out for you. And therefore, he is finishing the work he started in you. Therefore, he is creating again the new heart and the new creation. He is finishing it as you obey him. And part of obeying him is saying, Lord, I've been disobeying you. I've been falling short. Will you forgive me? I have no power to obey you unless I just rest here in your finished works of the cross. Unless I just surrender and listen to the power of the Holy Spirit that you sent as a school mom to lead me into heaven. Do you guys remember that story? It's an amazing story. I was sharing it with the guys that work today. When you see, when you see Abraham before he died, he said, Come here, head servant. Come here, Eleazar. Put your hand right here underneath my thigh. He's like, Hey, dude. And he's like, No. See, that's how they signed a contract in those days. Put your hand under my thigh. And so he did, and he said, promise me, you will not take a wife for my son from the people of this land, but you'll go to my people and get a wife. You with me? Listen. He says, okay, I don't know how I'm going to do it, but I'll do it. And he gets up, and he goes back, and he gets Rebecca. And when he gets, he's, he's almost there, and he's like, oh, my goodness, how am I going to be pleasing to my master? How am I going to please my master? Oh, Oh, yeah, my master, he would pray. Oh, Lord, uh, if you're real, uh, 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 help my journey be good. And uh, uh, the first person that comes out to get water, make it the bride. And here comes Rebecca. And she's a servant, and she's getting water. And he goes up to her, and he goes, tell me, whose child are you? And I'm paraphrasing. Oh, I'm... And he goes, it is, it's really there. It's true, faith works. I was trusting in the God of Abraham, and look. Here she is. Will you go with me? I need a bride for Isaac. I'll go. Gives him gifts. Gives him some jewelry. Let's talk to your family. To go back in and talk to the family. Can we leave now? No, stay for a couple of days. Carry along with us. Don't go with Christ right now. And they become a, that family becomes a type of like the devil. A type of the world trying to keep them there and conformed. And finally, they say, we're going now. You can't hold me up no more. 
It's almost like a type of the rapture. Boom. But see, Eleazar means one who comes alongside. Eleazar is like the Holy Spirit. Isaac is Christ. Rebecca is the bride. And, 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 and Eleazar comes alongside Rebecca, gives her gifts when she says yes. And then when she goes, he gives her more gifts. And then she goes on this 500-mile journey on a donkey through the mountains. And you never hear her complain once because she knows <laughs> she's going to go see her husband. She's going, and the next thing she sees is Isaac in the field. And she gets down, and Isaac still hasn't seen her face. But the whole time, it's the Holy Spirit preparing the bride. Right? But the, all the command came from the Father. All, all the promise came from, put your hand under my thigh. And he's the one that sent the provision, the redemption. Again, we look to the cross of Christ, the provision. But now the Holy hmm. Spirit's preparing us adorning us as a bride waiting for her groom to poof, be there in the field and we're there with him in the clouds and thus we'll be with him always. So cool. And all we have to do is know that the power is in God's provision to put the death, the sin nature, put it in the grave. I just agree with him. Hey, I'm crucified. How's that work? I don't know, Lord. Can you do it for me? Because I can't figure it out. How about if you crucify me and put me in the grave with you? How about if I'm so close to you, I just stay in the grave and let you live in my heart and tell other people about you? Amen? Amen. Amen. Father, bless uh, the rest of our weekend. Prepare us for Sunday morning. Lord, may we have a heart to read the text before we talk about it so that we can learn more. May we begin to read our Bibles and allow the Holy Spirit to teach us and train us and prepare us as a bride adorned for her groom. Come quickly, Lord Jesus. Come quickly. Amen. Amen.